Hello there! Welcome to Skating Key Productions. I'm Crown Grace Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video, we're going to ask them the question of what if Dewey beat Truman in 1948? Now, this idea was suggested by our contributor, Thomas Watson. Uh, he suggested the previous video as well, which is uh, what if the Confederates existed today? So definitely check that video out. But in today's video, we're going to focus in on the 1948 US presidential election. Now, this election was incredibly, incredibly close. Uh, all the pundits thought that uh, Thomas Dewey, uh, who was running for the Republican Party, would beat uh, Harry Truman, uh, who was you know, the sitting president already. But it didn't end up happening, right? So that's what we're kind of going to look into in this video. We're going to look at the different ways in which this election could have gone differently, and then also you know, like dive into some of like, the, the, the deeper history of it. But before we do all that, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, share one video with one friend. And also don't forget as well, we now have a Patreon account. So that definitely uh, check the link in the description there. So anyway, enough of my shameless plug. Now let's get back into the rest of the video. Now, with regard to uh, Harry Truman and him becoming the president, we've already covered quite a lot of the background of him in our video, uh, which is what if Truman uh, never became president. So definitely check that video out. There's quite a lot of uh, overlap between this video and that. Yeah, and there's certain things that we're gonna, not going to include in this one, which we're including that. So definitely check that out. But in this video, we're going to focus more on some of the other characters and also more specifically on some of the things that Truman did, which are very particular with, with the regard to this election. So first of all, we're going to talk about Thomas Dewey, right? So Thomas Dewey was a moderate Republican. So back in the day, uh, the Republican Party tended to be a lot more liberal and a lot more uh, moderate than it is today. Now, you know, you think about the Republican Party, you think uh, of, you know, conservatism, but this was not really the case yet up until like uh, the, the the presidency of Ronald Reagan where the Republican Party was you know solidly solidly uh, a, a conservative force so before this you had you know a lot more of a liberal uh, tinge and Thomas Dewey for instance when he was the governor of New York you know he doubled the amount of uh, uh, state funding which went towards education and he also increased the, uh, uh, the pay for state employees as well so Basically, the kind of liberal slash moderate Republicans, what they wanted was basically, you know, when it came to foreign policy, they were very, very much uh, like uh, interventionists and stuff. They, you know, they were so-called like cold warriors, but also they tend to be like very internationalist. They were pro like the UN and pro like uh, basically the Truman Doctrine, but they just wanted it to be even uh, tougher than, than, than uh, Truman was. Uh, however, when it came to domestic policies, they tend to very much uh, support many of the uh, New Deal policies that were uh, proposed by FDR and, and by the Democrats in general. And where they differed was that they wanted there to be a balanced budget, right? So although uh, Dewey did increase uh, the amount of money uh, in New York that went to uh, uh, all these provisions, it was a thing where he still, you know, balanced the budget and also was paying off the state's debt. So. This is essentially what like, the liberal slash uh, moderate Republicans wanted. Yeah, They wanted to have the New Deal, but they wanted it to basically be done on the cheap. You know, in the famous words of Thomas Dewey, yeah, he wanted, uh, as he called it, uh, pay-as-you-go liberalism. He said that government can be progressive and solvent at the same time. So that was basically you know, what he kind of wanted to do. However, the part of the problem with Thomas Dewey is that, you know, so he'd run in 1940 as a non-interventionist, yeah, like most Americans uh, prior to Pearl Harbor, they didn't want to get involved in the war, so that was the platform that he stood on then. Then in 1944, he ran and actually was on the uh, uh, ticket for uh, the Republican Party, yeah, so he ran against uh, FDR, and... In that one there, he had become a lot more uh, pro-interventionist. You know, and like by 1948, he'd become even more pro-interventionist. You know, so the problem with Dewey is that people kind of labelled him as being a bit of an opportunist, yeah, as being a kind of, kind of, seeing which way the wind blows kind of thing, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, like he was accused even by people within his own party of, of so-called like Me Tooism, right? Which is kind of, uh, not to be confused with that modern movement of course but basically just kind of saying oh yeah i like that as well you know so he tended to support like policies which are popular but it was a thing of you know what do you actually want to do as president like what are the things that you want to do like how would you govern differently from from what the democratic party is trying to do so this was a big kind of problem here that he was very vague with regard to what he wanted to do as president and also the fact that he was of the so-called like uh, eastern establishment which was basically very like pro-business uh, uh, kind of elites uh, like kind of you know um, it, 
it kind of made him very detached from like ordinary people. So people kind of thought, well, he's in favor of big business, in favor of this and that. But it's the thing where we don't really trust him. We don't really like him. Um, and we don't really know what he's going to do for people like us. And it didn't help also that he was overly reliant on opinion polls, right? You know, he, he almost had a kind of religious like zeal for opinion polls. And opinion polls, they're not to be dismissed. Like, they, they, you know, they are important. But at the same time, there's still a margin of error. And opinion polls also change as well. So while it's important to keep an eye on them, it's a thing where you shouldn't, you know, run your, uh, your campaign based purely on how you're doing in opinion polls. And this is the thing, he didn't attack Truman. Like, this is one of the, the major things. Yeah, I always say, when you're running an election, there's three things you have to do, right? So, you have to energise the base, you have to appeal to moderates, and you have to demonise the opposition, right? So, you know, so on the first one, energising the base, who are his base, really? How are you getting people to come out and campaign for you? What are you really running on? Are they really clear when at the doorstep, what you're kind of campaigning for? What are they arguing people at the doorstep for? And then, you know, appeal to moderates? Yeah, he did that. Tick, you appeal to moderates. But then when it comes to demonising the opposition, you didn't do that, right? So it was a thing where, you know, Truman didn't have this kind of hang-up at all, right? Truman labelled, like, the GOP as basically standing for grand old platitudes, yeah? He basically said that they were talking generalities and that, like, you know, and, like, there was nothing of any kind of substance that they were actually running on. And also, although uh, Dewey was far more moderate than many of the other Republicans in Congress, Truman uh, attached his candidacy uh, to this uh, conservative uh, uh, Republican Congress, which he labelled as the so-called do-nothing Congress. Now, the 80th Congress, you could say a lot of things about them, but you can't really label them as do-nothing, right? This is the Congress which passed uh, the Marshall Plan. This is the one which passed the Truman Doctrine. And this was the one that passed uh, the Taft-Hartley Act, right? So the Taft-Hartley Act was an anti-trade union uh, law. So it restricted the power of labor unions in uh, America. So again, you can support these things, you can uh, disagree with these things, but these are pretty significant pieces of uh, US uh, uh, government legislation. And in terms of uh, foreign policy with like the Marshall Plan and like the Truman Doctrine, it's quite difficult to say that this was a do-nothing Congress. But nonetheless, Truman ran uh, against the Republican Party, basically saying that they were do-nothing Congress. But something to note is that in this election, uh, the Republican Party was not the only opposition that the Democrats had to face. As a matter of fact, Harry Truman had to deal with people within his own ranks, yeah? And this was one of the main things that made this election incredibly interesting because this election represents an uh, election of uh, de-alignment, yeah? So every now and again in American history, there's like certain pivotal points here yeah, where you can see the, the different political parties begin to shift, yeah? And you can see, you can see kind of echoes of what's going to come later, yeah? Like kind of, uh, and, you know, the 1948 election was basically a... a, a uh, precursor for a lot of what you'd see in that in like the 1960s and stuff and this is mainly because in 1948 you know under the kind of new deal uh, uh, coalition you had uh, northern democrats you know who were like like uh, liberal and progressive etc and then you also had southern democrats who tend to be more conservative they were in favor of states rights and they were also pro segregationist right so these two camps were brought together under the new deal and basically because both sides you know supported like the, uh, the 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 extra government spending but on social issues the, you know the two groups were very very different and this is kind of what you start to see in this election so henry wallace who discussed in that previous video about truman right he had been the vice president under fdr However, in the 1944 uh, Democratic Convention, Truman ended up uh, taking over from him yeah, because people saw him as being too progressive and they wanted someone who's a bit more moderate, right? And that's how Truman ended up getting the job in the first place. So Henry Wallace was still very, very embittered from this. And so he split off and formed uh, the, the Progressive Party. So they were basically running on uh, desegregation. They were running on a very progressive platform, like kind of, you know, uh, for a repeal of the Taft-Hartley Act and all these kind of things right yeah and also wallace when he was doing campaigning uh, he spoke uh, in front of like desegregated crowds yeah so crowds where black people and white people were uh, like intermixed and stuff and he did this both in the north and in the south yeah and like you know he even got like eggs and like tomatoes and stuff thrown at him so it was a thing where you know 
in today's world, we see that as being very obviously progressive and ahead of its time. But in 1948, it's been incredibly uh, unpopular and stuff, right? So, you know, he didn't have much chance of actually winning, but it did still take votes away from the Democratic Party. Yeah, and on the flip side, you had the Southern Democrats, yeah, who, you know, were famously referred to as the Dixiecrats. And these were people who were very staunchly in favour of segregation, in favour of uh, uh, of Jim Crow. And they wanted the, the Southern states to have the right to maintain, like, uh, the system of Jim Crow, in spite of what people in the North would have wanted. So at the end of World War II, Harry Truman began to shift his perspective on race, right? Now... You know, in today's world, we'd see him as being, you know, a white supremacist and, you know, a, a very uh, racist. However, for the time, he was quite progressive. And what I mean by this is coming at the, uh, uh, at the end of World War Two, uh, he saw a lot of like returning uh, black GIs uh, coming from like uh, from Europe and from like Pacific and stuff. So people who had like worn American uniforms, who fought for America uh, uh, in World War Two. They were returning uh, to America and they came uh, back to many places in the South. But when they returned to the South, they were being mistreated by the people there. So although they were wearing US Army uniforms, there were many, many stories where they were being uh, brutalized in the street. You know, and like this kind of flew in the face of what America had been fighting for. America was, you know, fighting for freedom and fighting against that kind of uh, Nazism, etc, etc. But at home, their troops were being discriminated against, yeah, and, and being persecuted. So this was something which kind of shifted uh, Harry Truman's perspective. And he even famously said this famous quote, My forebears were Confederates, but my very stomach turned when I had learned that Negro soldiers just back from overseas were being dumped out of army trucks in Mississippi and beaten. So this gives you an idea of what the kind of situation was, yeah. So even though they're wearing US Army uniform, they're still getting beaten up in states like Mississippi. You know, so this spurred him when he became president, yeah, to set up the President's Committee on Civil Rights, and this was in 1946 to 47. And this kind of led to a lot of uh, executive orders where he uh, sought to, you know, desegregate the federal workforce, desegregate the military, impose federal protections uh, against lynchings. You know, up until that time, you know, FDR had like stayed away from all these kind of policies. You know, he didn't even want to have like photos taken uh, with himself and, and black people. You know, and this was just to keep like the, the Southern uh, Dixocrats like kind of on side. Uh, but Truman, you know, he took a very principled uh, stand against this. And even with regard to the, the elimination of poll tax, right? So poll tax, this is uh, what we've discussed in the previous video as well, with regard to the 24th Amendment. You know, so many of the southern states, uh, black people uh, were uh, disenfranchised, so they weren't able to vote because the, you know, many of them were too poor to be able to pay uh, for a certain poll tax, right? So this was a way of keeping black voters away from being able to vote at election time. So this is one of the things that he pushed for in, in, you know, in like the late 1940s, and this didn't end up becoming a constitutional amendment up until uh, 1964. So this was really, really ahead of its time. However, it obviously led to a split within the Democratic Party. And many people within the South, led by Storm Thurmond, they split away and formed the States' Rights Democratic Party, or as we more commonly kind of know it, the Dixiecrat Party. Now the goal for Dixiecrats in this election was not to win the presidential election. They knew that outside the South, they would not have enough uh, support. And so that wasn't really their, their aim. But their aim was basically to become the kingmakers for this election. So the idea was basically this, that if they were able to win enough states and get enough electoral uh, college votes, then they could basically, you know, uh, be the kingmakers in this uh, election. Because under the 12th Amendment of the US Constitution, it stipulates that if a majority of electoral college votes are not secured by one candidate, then the vote goes to the House of Representatives, yeah? And they are then able to decide on who the next president will be. So the idea was basically that, you know, within this very conservative uh, uh, Congress, what would basically happen is that, you know, they would be able to pick who they wanted and if it was decided that the Republican Party was more in favour of uh, maintaining these uh, states rights for the Dixiecrats then the Dixiecrat candidates would switch parties and vote for the Republicans. 
if however the democratic party like pulled back on its more uh, progressive thing and basically was like oh we want to keep these like uh, people within the democratic party then they would have to you know pick harry truman but harry truman would have to reverse many of the kind of civil rights uh, legislation that that he'd put in place you know so people like senator humphrey at the 1948 uh, democratic convention when he said that the democratic party should get out of the shadow of states rights and walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. You know, so this was basically the vibe of many uh, Northern uh, Democrats and stuff, right? However, in order to keep the, the Southern Democrats in place, you basically have to reverse much of that rhetoric, yeah, much of those policies. And so the Democratic Party would be very firmly in favour of uh, states' rights and uh, maintain this Jim Crow uh, uh, legacy far into like the, the future and stuff. So. This is kind of what we're going to get into a little bit later in the video with the alternative uh, uh, scenario, right? In terms of how this would completely change the makeup of like uh, US politics yeah, in the preceding de decades. And in fairness, the Dixiecrats did have a point because if you look at the 1952 uh, US presidential election, if you look at 1956, in both those cases, most of the Democratic Party support is in the South. So without the support of these Southern Dixiecrats, they wouldn't have had almost any uh, electoral college votes at all. And then you look at 1960 with the election of uh, JFK, it's a situation where without the vote of these uh, Southern Dixiecrats, JFK would never have actually been elected as president. And we covered that in a previous video as well, of just how close that presidential election was. So, you know, it's a thing where throughout like the next decade at least, you can kind of see just how much power the Dixiecrats had. And so the Democratic Party in the North having to push against like all, all this kind of desegregation yeah, is, is this is why uh, LBJ said in 1964 when he signed the Civil Rights Act he said the Democratic Party has lost the South for, for about 50 years and that's very much true even to this day for various different reasons uh, you know you know the parties didn't switch purely on this issue but this was one of the contributing uh, factors yeah like so it's a situation where the parties switched from you know the democratic party being the party of the south to the republican party becoming more and more the party of the south and the democratic party being more and more the party of the north you know so you can start to really see the indications of this in the 1948 election this is when like the preceding 20 or 30 years of u.s politics really begins to shift so now that we've covered the basic history of the 1948 election what we're going to do is we're going to imagine two separate scenarios, yeah? One in which Dewey wins on his own merits without the help of uh, the Dixiecrats. And the other, we're going to focus on the Dixiecrats and if it had ended up going to Congress. You know, so with regard to this first scenario, Dewey actually could have won this election if he'd actually put in a little bit more work if he'd actually attacked Truman uh, he probably could have won because in the three states of Ohio California and Illinois he came incredibly close to winning right so these are northern states with large populations and yet he came very very close as a matter of fact if you total up all the votes yeah between these three states Truman won by a margin of just 59,000 votes. Yeah, I've actually got on screen now of what the actual uh, vote count was, but it's incredibly close, right? So if 59,000 people had voted for Dewey as opposed to Truman, Dewey would have won that election anyway. So if this had happened, Dewey would have just, you know, he wouldn't have needed to appeal to the Southern uh, Democrats at all, and he basically could have just run on his own platform. However, as we've already said, we don't know what his platform was. He was so vague on what he wanted, it's kind of difficult to know what he would have done differently. You know, and then also in terms of the Cold War, you still would have had certain things like the fall of China. You know, maybe President Dewey would have got more involved in that than President Truman did. And, you know, maybe he sent like a few more troops to support like the, the, the nationalist in China, as opposed to, you know, Mao Zedong, like taking over the, the whole of the country. But it's kind of, unclear to see like kind of whether that would have happened also as well you've got the korean war I again i don't really know what he would have done differently as opposed to truman and then on top of that you had like the h-bomb you had the cold war kind of developing at a much uh, quicker uh, rate uh, like during like this the, the second uh, truman administration so I don't really know what D would have done differently than Truman, in all honesty. You know, so that's kind of where we have to end that first scenario. We're basically, uh, mm -hmm. it just would have been business as usual, really. Now, when we're talking about this second scenario, right, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So 
Within the South, the Dixocrats only won in states where they were pretty much the only people on the ballot, right? You know, so in the states where he won, instead of it saying the Democratic Party and the Dixocrat Party, the Dixocrat candidate was just labelled as the Democratic uh, candidate, right? So in these states, yeah, that they were able to, to win. However, what we're going to imagine in this is that in all the states in the South, this had been the case, yeah. So instead of there being a Democratic candidate and a, a Dixiecrat candidate, yeah, if it had just said the Dixiecrat candidate, but given the label of it being Democrat, so this would have got the Dixiecrat candidates over the line in these southern states, and this would have completely uh, tipped the balance, yeah, when it comes to the Electoral College vote. So in the first scenario, the Electoral College would be as following: Dewey would have two hundred and sixty-seven, Truman would have two hundred and twenty-five. And Stern Thurmond would have 39 uh, electors. So back in these days, yeah, you didn't need uh, 270 because obviously the states of Hawaii and uh, Alaska hadn't yet joined the union. So at this point here, instead of 270, you just needed 266 uh, electoral uh, college votes. You know, so under this system, him winning these three states would have been just enough for him to have uh, got enough uh, to become the president. Now, however, we're going to look at the second scenario in which, you know, the Dixiecrats end up, instead of having 39 electoral college votes, they have 128. You know, so in this case, Dewey would still have 189 electoral college votes, but Harry Truman would have 214. And uh, the Dixiecrats, as we said, would have 128. You know, so in this kind of election, it would go to the House of Representatives. And also something to bear in mind is this. In the so-called do-nothing Congress, the Republican Party were dominated, right? So the Republicans had 242 uh, congressmen and the Democrats had just 186. However, in the 81st uh, Congress, the House votes were, were as followed. It was Democrats with 262 and Republicans with 171. So as we can see with this election, it's almost a complete flip. Yeah, you can see like the, the maps on the screen. Uh, you can see, you know, it's a complete flip between uh, what the Democrats had and what the Republicans had. Yeah. So the Democrats are now in the ascendancy. However, this doesn't really matter so much because in both cases, the Democratic Party is heavily skewed towards the South. Yeah, so most of its support is in the South. And so you might have had a scenario which as the Dixiecrats kind of wanted for them to be the kingmakers, right? So if, for instance, the Southern Democrats had decided that, you know, uh, you know, through a bit of negotiation, like uh, Thomas Dewey said, OK, we'll allow you guys to do what you want in the South. Yeah. Then these Democratic uh, congressmen would have voted for uh, Dewey to become the president. And so they would have voted basically against their own party just to prove a point. So if this had happened, you know, Dewey, in theory, could have become the president through this kind of backhanded deal yeah, between himself and the Dixiecrats. So this would have basically shifted a lot of US uh, policy over the next few years yeah, because the Democratic Party would have almost, you know, every single election would have had some sort of like uh, PTSD and such yeah, because they would have always remembered, oh snap, when we abandoned the Southern Dixiecrats, we end up losing badly, yeah, right? And, you know, so in 1960, when JFK gets elected, rather than pushing for, like, civil rights and stuff, he would have been like, yeah, we're not touching that, right? And the same thing in 1964, as we have seen with the Electoral College vote of 1964, you know, like, the Deep South was the only place where Johnson didn't really uh, get many uh, Electoral College votes. And then obviously, again, when we see the 1968 election with, uh, like, uh, George Wallace here running uh, for the American Independent Party, again, we can see just how much of an impact this would have had, yeah, going all the way into the 1960s. So, Rather than there being the famous, uh, you know, Southern strategy, uh, like kind of, in, like which was uh, coordinated by Nixon, where basically he tried to, in a low-key way, kind of appeal to a lot of like uh, former Southern Democrats to vote for the Republican Party, the parties wouldn't have really shifted in this timeline. Well. That's not really true. It would have shifted, but kind of in the opposite direction. So the Northern Democrats, who would have been very perturbed by this, would have done one of two things. One, they would have had to recognise that in order to win an election, they would have had to kowtow to the uh, Southern Dixiecrats, and they would become more staunchly uh, uh, conservative. However, there's also many people who, who were like Liberal Democrats in the North, who would have been like, actually forget this, we're either going to like, form our own party, 
or we're going to switch our vote to the Republican Party because the Republican Party, don't forget up until this point, had been the, the, the party of civil rights, had been the party in which the majority of uh, black people uh, voted uh, for the Republicans and the majority of uh, white people in the South tended to vote for uh, the Democratic Party. So this would have been even more uh, solidified. So going into the 1968 general election, for instance, Nixon wouldn't have tried the Southern strategy. You know, preceding Republican candidates here yeah, wouldn't have tried this this kind of uh, policy. So going all the way into the present day, yes, eventually, like the cause of like uh, civil rights would have happened anyway and stuff. Yeah, in spite of like what the Democratic Party like you know in spite of what the democratic party wanted but it would have been republican presidents who would have like pushed for that it would have been republican congress people who would have pushed for that and so the parties as we currently understand today where you know the democratic party is a kind of northern uh, liberal party and the republican party is a kind of conservative southern party this would have been completely different in this timeline and so it's quite difficult to really predict how US policy would have been because like the politics of that era is kind of completely thrown just asunder yeah like if this election had gone along this way and many people in the north would never have forgiven the south many people in the south would never have forgiven the north etc etc so the preceding decades would have been a very tumultuous time and that's something to really kind of bear in mind you know, like if Thomas Dewey had made this kind of backroom deal, again, there's many people within the Republican Party who also would have like shifted, yeah, and, and tried to form some other kind of party because they wouldn't have wanted their man to have got elected based on the help of Southern segregationists. So it's it's so confusing. I I I don't really know kind of what how it would have gone differently. So please in the comment section, yeah, like, like, like type in like how you think it would have gone differently. Yeah. Like kind of like, and like some of the things that I might have missed out in, in this and stuff, you know, but with all that being said, we're going to have to bring that video to a close. So if you like that video, don't forget to obviously hit the like button, uh, subscribe if you haven't already, share one video with one friend. And as we said already, we've got a Patreon account now. So please like donate to that. Um, this is now my full time job. Uh, I've you know handed in my notice. I'll be leaving in mid July. So to get the ball rolling and to make this like my full time job and to make this something which is long lasting, I'll need a lot of support with like patrons and stuff. We're also going to be working on merchandise. You know, already you're thinking of like some designs like for coffee mugs and for pens and etc etc maybe t-shirts and hoodies like so if there's enough demand for that please let me know in the comment section what in theory you would like like kind of like in terms of merch in in, in the the coming like months and so so with all that being said definitely stay tuned for the next video which is going to be what if the business plot had been successful in 1934 so this is you know for those who don't know there was a, a attempt uh, uh, by the u.s military and certain people within the business community to basically do a coup and overthrow uh, fdr and this was stopped by major general uh, smedley butler uh, so yeah so definitely check that video out it's going to be really really good and uh, yeah in the meantime obviously like stay tuned for all of our other videos watch some of our clip videos as well because yo even if you have seen the full one from a few months ago watching these clip ones can uh, provide an extra bit of clarity and extra bit of focus on some of the things because if you've got a whole video talking about like xyz yeah right sometimes some of the most important things can kind of get lost in that you know so that's the purpose of these clip videos to really hone in on like the key key bits of information yeah and uh with that being said have a great day and bye